Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirabbil والحث على التمسك بكتاب الله وسنة رسوله صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم ودعاء إلى الهدى ودلالة الخير ابتغاء وجه الله ومرضاته وقربه وثوابه سبحانه وتعالى مع لطف وعافية برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم إن نزدك علم لدني ومشرب السوف يذهني يا وهب يا غني اللهم إن نزدك علم لدني ومشرب السوف يذهني يا وهب يا غني اللهم إن نزدك علم لدني ومشرب السوف يا الهني وهب يا غني صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم الحمد لله رب العالمين آمين الحمد لله right, we, are, uh, we are continuing our book Muhammad the Perfect Teacher right, and Insight into Teaching Methods by Sheikh Al-Fatah Bukhuddah نفعنا به وبيعلم في الدار إلى أن قال I may be benefited by him and by his knowledge in both abodes still where he has said right, So now we are going into the perfect traits of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a teacher right, When we learn his perfect traits right, it's basically not for us to think that we can ever be like Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam right, but it's more of to give us a goal right, So give us a guideline you know, uh, a goal right, to, to see where do we aim to right, and how do we you know, correct ourselves or better ourselves right, because we see the ideal Right, so he is basically the ideal in front of us, right, and we, we so so wherever of ourselves that we feel, you know, needs to be worked on. We need to improve. Boys, eh? <laughs> They're excited. Okay. <laughs> right, alhamdulillah, that's my nephew. I think that's my nephew. <laughs> my nephew gets very excited. All right. So, alhamdulillah. Right, so 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 wherever we see that uh, we lack in, in comparison to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, we work on it. Right, so basically, when you learn about the ideal, you learn about the the, the perfect human being. Right, it's not that we're going to ever be like Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Right, but even if we were to emulate even a fraction of what he was, even if we were to just you know be, make into our own character even a tiny bit of what he was, that would change <laughs> our entire lives drastically right, and those around us. Right, so here we are into the attributes of or the the perfect uh, speech or the excellence in speech that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam had. Eh, excellence in speech. So we are on to the seventh attribute and the eighth attribute that we take from today. Right, and thereafter we're gonna see how far we can go. Right, because I want to finish this chapter. We've been going. We've been here for quite some time. Right, so if you could, uh, you know, go a bit. See how lah. She got a lot. Right, so we won't go so far. All right, so. So Alhamdulillah, you can actually just fill in the circle. It's fine. <laughs> you don't have to sit at the side of the circle. <laughs> you can just fill it in. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, so number sev- seventh attribute. So here the Shaykh said, his speech was free-flowing and he confined himself to what was necessary and sufficient. Right, so we know we know Rasulullah Sallam wanted somebody to ramble. Right, he, there, there is not a single narration of him rambling. Right, going on and on and on and on about whatever. And he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't even nag. Right, he never nags Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? So it's actually, you know, when we see what he was, then we know what we should not be. <laughs> right, he was somebody who nag, he was somebody who rambled, he was somebody who, who just went on and on and on talking nonsense, right, rubbish. Right? So, you know, it's, it's something, these are all things that are blameworthy. Right? They're actually not of, um, not of good character. Right? To go around talking nonsense, to go around, like, like in our culture, they will say you lepa and you... I don't know why they they bubble, don't know why. I mean they 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 they, they like to talk. You know, just this talk, empty talk. Right. It's actually something that, you know, if you understand the reality of this world and the next world, you won't have time for these kind of things. <laughs> Not to say that you don't uh interact with your family and you don't uh you know uh have leisure time with them. You do. You do have leisure time with them, but 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 try not to and he have have the the conversation right, around things that don't matter. Right? Try to have the conversation around things that do matter. Right? And that, that that is what you know will be worthwhile. Right? But it's it's something that no don't talk about rubbish things. I don't know what people talk about anyway. <laughs> what do people talk about? You don't have to I don't know. My family is always something that matters. 
<laughs> like my, my father sometimes like, you all are scary. <laughs> you always talking about some issue. No, talk about community. The issues in the community. You talk about, you know, uh, uh, children, what should be done for them, not be done for them, upbringing. You talk about, it's kind of things lah. You know, like observations lah. You know. Oh, okay. It's okay. You're teaching you how to cook. She's, yeah, yeah, it's fine. Uh, so, but not like, I don't know, empty talk. I don't know why it's empty talk. <laughs> what do people do when you emptily talk? <laughs> talk about shows. Because you don't watch shows. You don't talk about shows. Talk about people is even worse. And dosa. And sinful. <laughs> and that's even worse. You, don't even, you, shouldn't even, you shouldn't even do that. Right? You're going to talk about people. So, like, you know, as long as you think about it, what do you all talk about? <laughs> or do you even talk? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I mean, because basically, what you talk about is what you fill your lives up with, right? So, so then it's really telling, lah. Right? What do you fill your lives up with, <laughs> right? So, I mean, for me and my husband, our conversation usually centers around books. Usually, <laughs> books, <laughs> books. Because it is reading, reading <laughs> books or like around there, lah. Because because nothing else occupies our mind. I mean, sometimes, because what you talk about is what occupies your mind, right? So, so if you're talking about people, it means you're always thinking about other people <laughs> in a bad way. If you're talking about them in a bad way, lah. But if you're talking about them, you know, if you're concerned and whatsoever, you're always concerned about other people, maybe, perhaps, right? So, I mean, talk, lah. So, so we know that it is not, it is not the way of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? Uh, to be to speak about things that don't matter, right? And he says that from uh, the hadith, min uh, husni Islam mar'i tarku malayani. Right from the beautification or from the excellence of someone's Islam, is that he leaves what does not concern him. Right, so from there, from today onwards, we must must guard over what you talk about. Right, so so in Abu Bakr as Siddiq, he used to have a stone in his mouth. Right, whenever he wants to speak, he would think first. And right? what am I about to say? Then, if he thinks it's worthwhile saying that it will it will it will be on his scale of good deeds on the day of judgment, then he takes off his stone and then he speaks, and then he puts it back. Right, so they're, they're really, really guarding over what they talk about. Subhanallah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Right, so he didn't speak at length as that would have been inappropriate. Right? He was somebody who would go on and on about something, but he was someone who was short. Right? He would, was direct to the point, And the Sahaba used to be able to memorize whatever he said. Right, that, was, that's, that, that is the truth of a, of a teacher. So you're going to teach. Right? Of course, explanation. Right, as long as you're doing the explanation, right, that, is, that is required. You can actually go into long uh, detail, right, or a lot of detail, right, about explaining the, the, the matter at hand. Right, but to go on, and even if you see Ben, the Shay, he speaks against nagging. Right, nagging, it's like... Uh, <laughs> yes, inform one time, done. Right, don't have, and, and the thing is that if someone does a mistake, you don't go on and on and on and on about that mistake. You don't. Yes, you don't. Uh, especially if they know it's a mistake. What, 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 what benefit do you do when you go on and on and on? I mean, what do you do except frustrate them? Uh, or get them, you know, angry with you or get them, you know, block you off or like, you know, my mom keeps nagging at me, my mom keeps... Uh, what? Like, they, they, like, you must think, what is the benefit? Uh, if you to teach them that what they did was wrong, then if you already know what they did was wrong, so why are you teaching? Uh, if you already know that it's wrong, they know it's wrong. <laughs> they know. Right, and maybe they don't know the consequences. We so see the consequences. Okay, then, 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 what else can you say? That's it. Right, you know that lying is wrong. For example, you know that lying is wrong. Why do you lie? Right. See, the prophet never lied. Okay, that's stop. That's it. <laughs> right, leave it. Then they know they can think themselves. They're not. They're not. They're not uh, unable to think. They're able to think. That is in teaching. So that you memorize. Yeah. 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 And sometimes he reprimands to make them memorize the hukum. He will repeat, uh, he reprimands and he repeats to make them memorize the law. Right? So repetition is more of, is, is with, the, with, with the intention of enabling the students to memorize. Okay, you see? So if there's a fa'idah, if there is a benefit in repeating, then it's repeated. Right? If there is no benefit in repeating, uh, it's not repeated. 
mm, it just makes them angry, you know, which which I do a lot with my husband. <laughs> Then he'd be like, you know, you're going on and on. <laughs> See, I, I, for me myself also, it's, it's like you nag and nag and nag, like you have to, all of us. Eh? Like you leave this here, and you want to go. And then he says, he was saying to me, the next time, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I know, right? I know you don't have to <laughs> go on and on. Then then you 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 strain the relationship. Then the the, the day becomes sour because you had you had to not stop your tongue. <laughs> you could not stop your tongue, right? So it's not the way of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is not. Right, so we need to actually remind ourselves, you know, it's, it's just not his way to just keep keep going on and on and on, nagging on somebody, right? So at the same time, he did not. Okay, I cannot see my mouth. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. See, Allah, she has a baby seat. Ah. <laughs> All right. So, so Masayda Muhammad, right? So, apart from situations, so at the same time, he did not remain silent due to any inability to express himself, right? Because, and as you see the footnote there, a person will remain silent because he does not know how to express himself effectively or convincingly. This is not the case of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sometimes people, people they, don't, they don't speak because they don't know how to say anything or they don't know how to express themselves. So, they, they tend to choose to keep quiet. For Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if he kept quiet, that means he sees that there is more benefit in silence. Now, he sees that there is more benefit in silence. Like the example of the man that came to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we took this hadith uh, previously, right, of the man that came to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and asked, you know, is Hajj uh, wajib every year? We just took the hadith, kan? So, 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 the, so Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said on, on, on a pulpit saying that Allah has commanded Hajj unto you. So the man came and the man said, every year, ya Rasulullah, he turned away. I had no answer. He kept quiet. Then he came again, every year, ya Rasulullah, he turned away. And when I came again, every year Rasulullah, he turned away. Right? And Rasulullah said to him, if I had said yes, it would have been compulsory. Right? And he didn't want to say no either. Because if you can go every year, go lah. Right? So you can't say yes, no, no. <laughs> like if you say yes, compulsory. If he says no, then people might take it as, as, as haram to go every year. You know, like, so, so, so there's no answer to your question. And he, so, he said to, so he said to him, if I had said yes, it would have been compulsory on you and you would not have been able to do so. Right, so if I leave something, don't ask me about it. Right, so so, so, so Rasulullah he has silence. He keeps silent about things. And the Sahaba they call it, you know, in in a, in, a, in the science of hadith, right? The, it's a science of silence. It means under the hadith science, there is a chapter on the silence of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, on when he saw something and he kept silent. Right, which means that he doesn't want to make it sunnah nor makro, right? But silent, mubah is permissible. Right, so he doesn't want to encourage it. Or discourage it, but he will not take part in it. Right, but he stays away from it. So it's not makro, it's not sunnah, it's nothing. Right, you're allowed to do it. Right, so the, 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 the Sahaba actually speak about this, right? About, about when something happens in front of him and he just allowed it. He saw it and then he allowed it. Right, so that is also part of the hukum lah, right, that you can actually do this kind of things. So his silence is because to keep silent is better. <laughs> and so, so of our learning from Rasulullah, we need to know when silence is actually better. Right, when is it better to just shut your mouth right, and not say anything? Right, it's, it's, it's a skill. It's a skill to know when to keep quiet. <laughs> Especially as women. Right, we all have issues with our mouth. Right, if, our, if our husbands, you know, our family, our brothers, our, you know, Allah, we need to know when to just you know, zip it. Right? <laughs> right, if our children, you know, it's just too much that we want to say. And then it goes in our mind and the whole thing, think about it. Then you say, I should say this, I should say it. No, you know, and then I should say, I should have said that. Yeah, I should have said that. <laughs> and so, I know, I know, I'm speaking for all of us, kind. <laughs> okay, maybe just for me, lah. <laughs> yeah, Sayyidina Omar said, Sayyidina Omar said, I have never regretted any of my silences, but I have regretted so many times my speech. <laughs> Right, so we <laughs> we regret our silence. <laughs> she said something, <laughs> right, but of course not to say that uh, if you see something wrong in front of you, you keep silent. That one is haram. Yeah, she falls under haram. Right, it's under blameworthy silence. Of course, if you find that to speak will cause more uh, damage, then you remain silent. 
right? And then you hate it if your heart like, is the weakest of weakest of iman, especially in a hadith, right? The weakest of iman is to hate a munkar with your heart. Uh, if you cannot say something against it with your tongue, right? but if you're able to do so, you need to do so and not go down to the weakest of iman. Right? At least for us, like, so many times we're all at the weakest of iman stage, whereby we just see something and we hate it with our hearts. Right? No, if we, if we can possibly nicely say something, you know, beat your way around it or Maybe not at that point in time, but later you can just slot it into your conversations. You know, like you slide it in. Habib Omar said that whenever you go and you go and visit people, you should always have something in mind that you want to share with them. Right? <laughs> you should always plan something <laughs> in mind that you want to share with them. So when you actually go and visit them, right, in the conversation you slot it in. So you don't like oh let's talk about something beneficial you know you don't you don't do that also. let's have a lesson no you don't do that you just in the conversation you in your mind you're consciously thinking how am I going to steer this so that I can insert like uh, my 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 advice you know or my good or whatever I learned whatsoever I want to I want to insert it in right without it seeming that you're trying to preach right but just you know in the in the natural flow of conversation right so you say that is actually a skill. I mean, it's not done just what happens, right? But it, it's actually a conscious effort that people actually do. And I do it a lot with you all. <laughs> a lot. And I speak you all, I actually put stuff in, put stuff in, put stuff in. Right? That it seems that it's like, oh, yeah, you know, but, but she's all planned. <laughs> is it, is it, but you should be doing it. You should be doing it. That's how you do your da'wah, subtly. Right? Without people feeling offended. Because we're in a time where people feel offended uh, easily. Right? So to not to offend people, you just... Put it in, right? You sort it in, all right. So Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Masayna Muhammad. Apart from situations of need and necessity, none could compare with the beauty of his silence, serenity, and composure, right? Hence, his speech was memorized without omission, and his splendor was revealed without defect. Its sweetness was appreciated by all, and it therefore remained protected in the hearts and was recorded in books. Right, so the speech of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his silence. Right, he is a prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. His main duty is to pass a message. So if you have to pass a message for generations to come, you have to excel in your speech. <laughs> because how are you going to pass pass a message if your students are going to forget everything that you say? <laughs> you need the students to memorize stuff, right, so they can pass on to the next generations. Of course, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala had His uh, hand in there, whereby Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala allowed the, the the Sahaba to memorize, right? They hear one time and they memorize it, right? So Sayyidina Abu Hurairah was one of them. Sayyidina Abu Hurairah's story is very interesting. And Abu Hurairah, who is the foremost of the muhaddisin, he's the foremost of those who narrate hadith. And Abu Hurairah, he actually entered into Islam late. And he was not of the first few Sahaba. He entered really quite late into Islam. It was after the he entered into Islam after the conquest of Mecca. Quite late. Quite late. Only a few years before Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But he is the foremost in hadith narration. About five thousand hadiths on his tongue. Right, more than that. Right, he's the foremost by far. Eh? By far, that means by by compared to other Sahaba, Sayyidina Abu Huraira, by far he is uh, uh, the foremost in memorizing hadith. Right, are you are confused. Ahlu Sufa, Ahlu Sufa, basically people of the bench. Huh? he is a Muslim. No, he he is Ahlu Sufa for two years. <laughs> right. Huh? No, 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 no. Conquest of Mecca is before Hajj. Conquest of Mecca happened in which year? Which year did the Conquest of Mecca happen? Huh? Okay, so from Hijra, when was the Conquest of Mecca? He passed away on the 10th year. <laughs> I mean, 11th year lah. He finished the 10th year, he passed away on the 11th year. What year was the conquest of Mecca? <laughs> yes. Then after that, is after the conquest of Mecca, there was the. So the eighth lah. Wait, wait. He Hudaybiyah was on the fourth year. Like fifth year, fifth year, fifth year. Then three more years. Eight, correct. Right, so eighth year after Hijrah, that means that at that point, a lot of people entered into Islam. A lot of people entered into Islam. So I was saying that around there, lah, two to three years before Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam only, eh, 
only and he came into islam he was old abu sayyid abu huraira is an old man don't think of him as a young man if you saw some he was a huh? lover of cats right? so basically is his story is that he came into islam and then he came to medina to learn from rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he came to medina homeless homeless nothing he has no wealth whatsoever very poor right so he was sit at the mosque so ahlus sufa basically the homeless they so ahlus sufa ah ahlus sufa at the mosque the all person was up at the homeless they sit on the, the this area where they sit there they all homeless right so abu huraira has love hadith about him and and being homeless lah but he said was so hungry one time he said that ahlus sufa has no clothes so that's he's all his hadith it's all his hadith right he's called abu huraira right because his name is abdul rahman right uh, but he he was called abu huraira because there was once he was carrying a kitten in his sleeve they're huge sleeves So getting a kitten there, right? So, <laughs> so Rasulullah SAW saw so him with the kitten, and then he said, "Yeah, Abu Huraira or Abu Hir." Then he said, "Abu Hir." Hir means cat. Huraira kitten, right? So father of kittens, right? So uh, he used to carry the kitten around and feed the kitten, <laughs> right? So, but basically, in Abu Huraira, his story was that he would hear he was because he's homeless and he's jobless. They're homeless and they're jobless. Right? So he would hang around the mosque, Rasulullah SAW, and he would. Uh, attend every single halaqah that's there. They will just sit in and sit in and sit in and sit in and all the all the lessons. Because they're homeless and they're homeless and they are jobless. And he was not married at the time, right? So, so Sayyidina Abu Raira, he would he would hear all the stuff from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he found that when Nabi Rasulullah Sallam would leave the mosque, he forgot everything. <laughs> so he went to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ya Rasulullah, <laughs> I sit here the whole day with you, hearing stuff from you, and then I forget everything. <laughs> <laughs> and then Rasulullah is he also made dua for me, so Rasul made dua for him, right? And then thereafter he never forgot a thing, right? So the dua of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? So this is why he said his his hadith is numerous because whatever comes in memorize, memorize, memorize. <laughs> he can't even help it, you know. So uh, he's of the Sahaba who memorize uh, many hadith, of the other Sahaba who memorize a lot of hadith, say Aisha. Right, that is because of her brilliance. She was a brilliant person in herself. Right, so her brilliance, and then uh, say Ibn Abbas, Ibn Omar, right, they're all also brilliant, brilliant uh, Sahaba. Right, say Ali, right, also one of those uh, who narrate a lot of hadith. Right, these are people who the narrators of hadith. Right, so 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 these people. So not every Sahaba who sits with Rasulullah SAW will actually narrate hadith. Not to say they didn't memorize hadith. They probably memorized a lot of it. Right, but a lot of them were just too scared to narrate. Because of the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whoever says against me a lie, then let him reserve his place in the hellfire. Right? It's a very strong hadith against those who fabricate hadith. Right? So, so when Sayyid Abu Bakar heard that hadith, he went home and he burnt his hadith collection. Sayyid Abu Bakar had a hadith collection; he burnt everything right? because he was so scared that somewhere in that collection was something that he wrote that it was wrong. Right, so they were so scared. They were so scared that even a, a you know a conjunction or a preposition was was off. Right, they were so scared that it was not. He said he said summa. I wrote far. You know, like for example, you know, like he was. They were so scared. Right, so <laughs> he burned. And so so we wonder what hadith Sayyidina Abu Bakr actually uh, had right in his in his collection. Right, they, all of them, all of them had their own collections. But then they 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 destroyed it thereafter. I right? got they were so scared of 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 not being accurate. I mean, what they did from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right, but Rasulullah Sallam, his speech was memorized without omission, right, and its splendor was revealed without defect, right. Uh, uh, and and all of it is it remains protected in the heart. So you see, of ulama later on, they memorize thousands of hadith. Right? And sometimes you're wondering, eh, how come they can memorize thousands of hadith with Zainab Abu Huraira only mem- only only related about five thousand? You 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 are here like you know Imam Imam Malik Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, you know the big imams they memorize ten thousand hadith. So you're wondering where do you get ten thousand from? If the, the the Sahaba you put all together, you only find you know a few thousand. Like, you know how can it be so many? Right, the ulama say that when they say they memorize that that number, right, it's more of they memorize with the different sanads, same hadith but different sanads, right, different narrat- narrators, right, for the same hadith. So that's why it become numerous, right? But basically same hadith lah, right? So the eighth attribute of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he spoke and explained most eloquently, clearly, and concisely. He had the largest vocabulary of words and was most adept in their usage. So the most perfect of speech, yeah. right? So Subhanallah, and and and, and Sheikh Hamdan Yusuf, he does say that that the development of a person's language does develop their thinking. 
Uh, if you really want your thinking to develop far, you know, you need to develop your language because it's, it's when you lack language that your mind is unable right, to capture what you want to express. Right? You know, because you don't have a language for it. Right? So your mind can't go so deep <laughs> right? because your mind can't, doesn't know how to express that part right, of what you're about to think. So when you have more, your, if your language is vast, right, you're able to think deeper. Because you have the language for it, right? You think, actually think deeper. So, so, and, and it's mentioned that, you know, especially for, especially for Arabic, like Arabic really sharpens your mind. It, re- it does, I tell you, it does. <laughs> Arabic really, if, if, you want, if you want to increase your intellect, learn Arabic. Right? Because Arabic makes you jump from, from, from all the nouns, prepositions, all, it's all kinds, it's such a complicated language. <laughs> <laughs> it's so complicated Arabic, you know. If you're trying to get it, if you're trying to get it perfect, all right. Even the Arabs themselves have issues or have trouble speaking in correct Arabic. And very few, in, in, in they are amongst the Mashaikh, they are amongst the Shuyukh right, who actually speak, you know, in 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 correct Arabic. Right. So it's, it's you know, Subhanallah, <laughs> Hamdulillah. Right. So, but Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was the most eloquent, the, the most clear, the most concise in his speech. And in Arabic, right, eloquency right, is equals to being concise. It means to say something in a few words and to encamp- en- encapsulate all the meanings is eloquent. To them, that is eloquent. To say something or to explain a very uh, uh, complicated concept in very simple terms, that is eloquency. And because your whole point is not for you to sit here and confuse people. And that's not the point. So you can't be a teacher and come into the class and speak with such, you know, big bombastic words and whatsoever, and then no one understands what you're trying to say. <laughs> that's not the point. The point is supposed to, you're not supposed to come to class and, 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 and you know impress everybody with how great your language is. No. Right, but eloquency is basically to, to understand something so complicated and bring it down to the people. Right, so Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he had the highest, uh, he had the greatest vocabulary, uh, the largest vocabulary. But at the same time, when he spoke to the people, he used simple terms so that the Bedouin who comes can understand. Right, and if you look at at um at khutbah, khutbah or Friday prayers, the khutbahs are usually simple, right? Because for the layman, right, whoever has come, you know, so so simple things that they're going to talk about, not too complicated, right? So that everybody can go home and they will be and and and, and they learn something. Right, from the khutbah today. So that is the point, right? So, so Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right, he, he, uh, dull formalities were never part of his speech and it was never interspersed with glutteral sounds, which we have a lot, right? So, glutteral sound means that, ah, uh, ah, uh, uh. <laughs> right? So when I learned this, I was like, subhanAllah, right, we need to, uh, so, so I tried to, to replace the glutteral sounds with slawat. So at least you don't do an uh you call Muhammad 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 so you try not to do the uh so much <laughs> right so he didn't have that so he so so and, and but the sahaba sahaba said that he, his his speech was always uh interspersed with istighfar astaghfirullah astaghfirullah tawbu ilai wa atubu ilai astaghfirullah wa atubu ilai and within his speech right, but not that he's thinking because he can, he can actually speak without without you know pausing to think right, because of his perfection la rasulullah so so for us you know, to it's, it's difficult. It's actually very difficult to speak without having these glutteral <laughs> sounds. I mean, having the uh right, or the mm, uh, it's very hard to speak <laughs> if you want to try. Right? But if you can, then train yourself that if you need to think, you train your tongue to slow it. Train it. It can be, it can be trained. It can be trained. Right? Then before you know it, that whenever you have to think, your tongue goes into slow it. Right, at least something is being said that's beneficial. <laughs> right, besides saying, uh, <laughs> can eh? So next time we're going to see that everybody going to go around and everybody's like, how come everybody's doing slow hand? <laughs> Where do you all learn this from? <laughs> right, for me, I heard it from my teachers. So they will always go, almost say Muhammad. Right, whenever they have to think or they forget what they're about to say, right, they'll go into slow hand. Right, so then, then you're like, oh, that's nice. <laughs> I just want to be like that. <laughs> And then you you start to 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 to, to train yourself, but then you keep forgetting a lot of things. Then your whole speech all slow, 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 because you forget so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, what's his name? Al Masayda Muhammad. What's his name? Al Masayda Muhammad. Yeah, his name is Al Masayda Muhammad. <laughs> yes, that's his name. <laughs> no, but basically because slawat uh, sharpens your memory. Just why you do slawat? Right? Because when you when you feel your memory fading, <laughs> you do a lot of slawat, it comes back. Right, so subhanallah. Right, many of his jawa jawami al kalim. Right, you mentioned about jawami al kalim. And jawami al kalim uh, is is a miracle of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, whereby he's able to 
uh, he's able he's able to encapsulate the entire meaning, right, deep meanings in a few words. And it's called Jawami al Kalim. Right, so for example, the hadith we went we went through before, Adinu Nasiha. Right, the religion is advice and good counsel. Right, so in that one statement, or oh, the scholars will write a lot about what that actually means. Right, so it uh, many 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 examples of our Sulaiman speech, but he will say three words, four words, and in it is an entire ocean of meaning. Right, that is that is of the miracles of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Right, it's called it's called being profound. Right, it is called being profound, and it is something that I feel I mean, is sad lah that that we have turned to the words of everybody else, except the words of our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Right, when his words are the most profound, like nothing, nothing in life, right, the, nothing you can go through in life you can't find in the hadith. Nothing. There is nothing in life you can find in the hadith. Everything in life you can definitely find in the hadith, and may Allah subhanahu wa taala reward Imam Nawawi. Anhu on our behalf by him compiling the hadith and putting it into sections, right? According to uh, values, right? so according to sabr, according to tawakkul, according to shukr, according to so he put all he he because he compartmentalized the hadith for us, <laughs> right? So if you want to think about you know a, situ- a situation whereby whereby you need uh, patience, you can just open up the book and learn about patience. It's all there, all the hadith about patience, all there. So Imam Nawawi radiallahu anhu, right, he basically did an, the entire thing for us. Right, he wrote all the hadith into, into sections. Right, so you can, refer, you can refer to it easily. Right, so uh, the 40 hadith of Imam Nawawi also, right, all of life in there. All of life. There is not, there's not, nothing in life that you, are, that you could be going through that you cannot find in the 40 hadith of Imam Nawawi. Everything is there. It's only 40 hadith. It's not that many. <laughs> Everything that is important in life is found in that, in that collection. So Subhanallah, so that is and that is how perfect our Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, right? That, that Subhanallah, he's he's such such, such you know uh, concise speech. I right? can govern the lives of his followers till the day of judgment. Right? So, it's a miracle of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Many of his Jawami al Kalim statements have been compiled. Jawami al Kalim meaning concise speech. Right, have been compiled, right, and no human speech can compare to his eloquence and, rhetor- uh, and, and rhetoric. Furthermore, his statements are numerous and rich in meaning. Right, his words are easily distinguishable from those of others by dint of their style, which was vastly superior to that of anyone else. His speech is clearly distinguishable from the lines from the lies attributed to him, and it is very true. It is very, very true. If you learn enough hadith, you'll be able to, to sense the style of speech of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when you hear a fabricated hadith, you can actually sense that's not from him. You can sense it. Right? That, that's not what, he's about, what he would say. Like, if, even for anybody, if you know someone well enough, right, and then someone says, oh, so-and-so said this. And you're like, I don't think she did that. Because I know her well. And I don't think she said this. Right, so for example, you know, like, like your mother, you know your mother very well, for example. That's why I know my mom very well. My mom, you know, if someone came to me and said, oh, your mother recommends this film. I, I will say, my mom did not recommend any film. <laughs> and my mom doesn't watch films. <laughs> right, and it says that you, 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 you know. Like, or you say, oh, your mother said such, you know, terrible, you know, uh, words. And I said, no. My mom, throughout my life, she has never said anything. Uh, 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 Anything that is indecent in that way, ever in her life, she's never scolded us in that way. Right? So, if someone who's come to me and, and make claims about my mother, straight away I'll, I'll know that's not true. Without even asking her, without even asking her, I know it's not true, right? Because I know her right? and I know the way she speaks, so I know that is not the way she speaks. You are lying against her, right? So, with Rasulullah, Allah, some same thing. If you learn enough hadith, you will begin to sense, you know, how do you. That this is the, the style of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Which is why when you learn the hadith and Quran side by side You can see very clearly That the one that's speaking in the Quran Is not the same one that's speaking in the hadith They're not the same one So it's impossible that he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Was the one who wrote the Quran Impossible Because that is not his style And the Quran has a very strong majestic style Of God That only God has and The hadith has a very teacher-like Father-like you know, a very uh, gentle style that what a father would take. Right? But the Quran has a very, you know, like a king, a very majestic, you know, that there is this entire sense, you know, of the one with full authority speaking. 
Right. So, so it's, it's, it's very different. It's very different. So those, you know, who claim, you know, and there are those people who claim that you know, the Quran is done by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It means, obviously, they've not said the Hadith, nor they've said the Quran. I have to make such claims. They're just making claims out of nowhere. Right. Oh, it's obvious. It's obvious. Right. So when you learn, you know, and, and there, are, there are like uh, the, the, the saints there of the past, right? When people narrate Hadith, they can smell Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right. From the mouth of the person, they can smell. Right. So... <laughs> So if it's a fabricated hadith They can smell the stench And straight away they turn away They know it's not a real hadith they can, There are those who can see light coming out And when they hear the hadith of Rasulullah SAW And so, so when they don't see light coming out They know that it is fabricated Ulama of the past who can, who, They're so pure With Rasulullah SAW Sayyidina Imam Malik radiyallahu anhu And Sayyidina Imam Malik He is a tabi'in 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 so Sayyidina Ibn Malik, he met Sayyidina Abu, Sayyidina Abu Hanifa. Sayyidina Abu Hanifa, he met the Sahaba. So just three generations down. Sayyidina Ibn Malik, whenever it was his hadith class, right, he would, he would first and foremost take his wudu, full wudu. In fact, he would bathe. Every hadith class, he would bathe. Take a shower. Right, then he would do his wudu. Then he wear his best clothes. Then he put on his atar, uh, his perfume. Right, then he would burn bukhur. In one condition, all of you doing it. We're doing hadith class. You're not following Imam Malik. <laughs> right, Imam Malik would do. He would do all of that, right? And then he would sit down, and, and they say he would, he would, he would take the hadith, and then he, the, the, the all of his students will be in in a in a in a mood, right? in, in, a, in a in a in a mood lah. Then he would narrate the hadith, and they will see him shake. Sayyidina Imam Malik, he would shake from the hadith, right? And then and when he was asked, like, why do you do all of these things? And then he said, if you knew who was speaking, right, if you knew whose words this were, you would also be in the same sp- state. So subhanAllah, Imam Malik, you know, he, they, these are the scholars of the past, but they, they, hadith, you know, hadith makes them shake. And they hear that the, the words of the beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right, and they, they, they articulate every letter well. You know, from, from what Rasulullah said, like, it's, it's, like, it's like pearls coming out of his mouth. And this one, the Sahaba used to do that. The Tabi'in used to do that. Right, we are 1,400 years later. <laughs> we should try at least to be in wudu. At least you can be in wudu, be in wudu. If you can. Right, if you cannot, if you have your, your menses, you have issues, whatever, it's fine. Right, but if you can be in wudu, be in wudu. You can cover your aura, cover your aura. Right, so these are all, you know, adab, right, with knowledge. You know, having etiquette with knowledge. The people of the past, they used to understand right, what it meant by having etiquette with knowledge. Right. So Rasulullah SAW, so he spoke, uh, Masayana Muhammad. Okay? Right, so this has been, has been previously, this means that the words were few, but extremely meaningful. In other words, if anyone attributed a fabrication to Rasulullah SAW, his actual words could be easily distinguished. This was possible because of his clear eloquence and distinguished style. So they can easily, the ulama can easily sense if a hadith is, is fabricated. They can even sense if something was inserted into a correct hadith. So the hadith was original. They can sense if someone inserted something in. Same with the Quran. The Quran same thing also. If anyone tried to remove something from the Quran or to insert something in the Quran, the people of the Quran, of, of Quranic knowledge, they, they, can, they can hear it. This is not what the Quran said. This is not what the Quran said. Right? So they, they can hear that you change something or you insert something or you remove something. Right? From the Quran. Same thing with hadith, they can hear that is not how he said it. Right? He said it in a different way. It's not it's not that's not that's not that's not, that's not it. He achieved all of this although he did not practice rhetoric, right, balaga, or intermingle with, with people of this branch of knowledge, whether they were orators, poets, or people of eloquence. Rather, he was born eloquent. As this attribute was necessary was a necessary one to enable him to meet demands of his future. So, you know, Rasulullah wasallam, he was able to speak, you know, in complete, of course, uh, in, 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 in the best form of Arabic. But at the same time, Rasulullah wasallam, he knew the dialects of the Arabs around Mecca and around Medina. He knew all the dialects. He knew all of them. Uh, without, even, without, without ever having to study any of the dialects. So when somebody from, from, from another land would come to Medina and speak to him, he would speak to them in the dialect. And so and the other day I was into Habib Omar and he was saying that that you know even for us today, those who dream of Rasulullah Islam, if you don't know Arabic, he'll speak to you in your language. And he'll speak to you in English or in Malay or in he will. No Rasulullah Islam. And Habib also. Habib also. He said, Habib said, 
that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he comes to you in your dreams, he will speak to you in your tongue, right? In your tongue, right? In your own, in your own language. Don't think that if I meet him in my dream, I can't speak to him. He's just Arabic, <laughs> and I don't know what to say to him. <laughs> I know he can actually speak to you in your tongue, right? So, so, so that is the and that and this was something that was from before. That means during his lifetime, any of the people who came to him, he will be able to speak to them in their tongue. Yes, well, in India, in India, in India uh, dialect. Right, that is uh, something that is specific for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which tells us also. I mean, what we can learn from this is that whoever you are doing da'wah to, right, then you have to come down to what they understand. Right, so even though it is it's the same language, but you must speak to them in how they understand. Right, so of course, with these children, you speak to them in their language. Right, and what in what in what interests them. Right, when you speak to teenagers, you speak to them in their language also. Right, what 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 do they want to know about? You know what what do you what do you da'wah to them about? When you speak to uh, people who are trying to come back to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, tauba. Right, what kind of speech do you do you use also? When you speak to those who are supposed to be tolerable the you know, people's uh, students of knowledge, how do you speak to them also? Right, so Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the way he was. Wherever whoever was the audience, he would cater his speech to them. Right, so they understand as much as they can. Right, so you don't stay with how you are. You say, no, I'm somebody who, you know, I never go on that kind of level. You know, I'm someone who speaks, you know, in, in such, you know, great uh, vocabulary, for example. No, if you see some people who are, they, they understand simple things, you go down to a level and then you explain to them. Right, anything can be taught to anybody if you know how to teach it. Right, if you know how to teach it. Alright, so that is the way the speech of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So now we're going on to his actions, excellence in his actions. These can be gauged from eight attributes. So again, eight attributes, eh? So the first attribute he is his excellent manner and sound management in religious affairs, by means of which he led his followers away from the familiar towards that which was new and strange. And consequently, people submitted themselves to Islam with both apprehension and hope. This was certainly no easy task in which success would not have been possible without divine assistance and firm determination. All right. So here, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You see, he sent to a people who have their own culture, they have their own habits, their own situations. Right. So for a teacher to have to change all of that. Right, they are drunkards. Right, they are. They, they commit sins in the open. Right, the rich and the and the and the, and the powerful rule. Right, a lot of injustice all over the place. You know, widespread injustice in this land. Right, they they are so used to their idols. They always you know turning to their idols. So so to to change all of that, which is why the ulama say that the Sahaba of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is one of the miracles of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right, they the, the Sahaba themselves, right? The entire this community of Sahaba, they are a miracle, right? Themselves because of what they were to what they became under the hands of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I mean, it's a one man, is 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 one man, a right? one man that was sent by God, of course. You know, God has his has his hands in it, right? But one man coming to a community, we can't even help, we can't even do things do it to our family, right? More what more to entire entire people, entire an entire race. Of Arabs, they were all changed right, by the way by by the teaching of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and this was done mainly first and foremost through his excellent manners, right? Excellent manner and sound management of his affairs, right? And from there, they 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 loved him, therefore they began to imitate him, right? So the first step right towards people accepting what you are about to teach them is that they have to love you first, and so when they love you. Right, they begin to accept what you have to say, right? Because they, they, they because you know, there's this opening of the heart that happens in the human being. So with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right, there is this thing about loving him first. Because when you love him, your obedience of him is very is is natural. It comes, it just comes like that. Right? And the same thing with any anybody, any human being. Right? If you don't love, if you don't specifically love, right, a teacher, you know, or a parent, they don't really you know have a strong love for them, then it's easy to disobey. Uh, it's easy to not to not uh, take their advice right about things, but of course this has to be paired with uh, your own thinking lah. I mean, for some, some it's always it's always correct, it's always true. Right? But people later on, you know, your, your own parents or whatever, you love them, but sometimes their advice uh, is not sound. Right? Sometimes, right? So here you see, Rasul Sam, he is he is his excellent manners and his sound, his excellent manner, right? The way he was and sound management, right? Because he was he was always someone who was fair. Right, so you are someone who is always fair. People will will take your words seriously. 
I mean, for somebody who's like, you know, you, you, you're unfair, you're unjust, you keep changing, you, 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 you insult other people, whatsoever, people don't take you seriously after a while. So it says here that it is certainly no, it is certainly no easy task in which success could have been possible without divine assistance and firm determination. So there was two things for Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, like his divine assistance and his firm determination. If his proclamation was an order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it served as an absolute proof. And if it was based on his personal, personal judgment, it was a brilliant sign of his prophethood. And the fact that Islam's foundations remain perpetually firm proves his greatness and serves an, a, as an explanation for those who doubt it. Right, as Islam was conveyed from one generation to the next, its sweetness and vibrancy intensified in their hearts and they considered it to be the perfect system despite the customs and differences of each era. I hear all this entire thing is all because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed Islam. So it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So no matter what time, what age, what the people are, you know, how they are, right, uh, Islam will always Islam Islam will always be relevant right, to the people and it will manifest the best in society. Right? Islam was held on to properly. Okay. Alright, so second attribute, he combined the yearning of those who had hope with the apprehension of those who had potential. Right? So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, at the same time, he gave hope to those uh, who felt you know, that they can't, they can't, they can't practice his religion. Right? And he gave uh, a push to those who can do more. Right? So like for example, a teacher, you have students who are at the brink of giving up. And you don't, you don't want to try the exam, they're just getting all wrong whatsoever. So you have those students. Then you have students whom you feel are not pushing themselves hard enough. It means they can do more, but they're not. And they're staying where they are. And you have all these students around you. Right? So a, a, a good teacher will be able to cater to the needs of their students. So because if you push the ones about to fall into despair, you might just break them. You can't push them. Right, but you need to encourage them by holding their hand, pulling them forward. Right, don't, don't, don't be hard on them because they might just you know, cry, break down, and then they give up. Right? But at the same time, those who are able to do more, right, then you push them. Right, that's how they are. So this, to do this, a, a teacher actually needs to know her students. You need to know your students. Right? So Sayyidina Ibn Abbas, for example, also someone said, you know, what a great man Ibn Abbas is. If only he prayed in the night. Right, clear hadith. Right, so uh <laughs> so the, the hadith reached Sayyidina Ibn Abbas, and he heard from somebody else that was saying, you know, "What a great man you are, Ni'mar Rajul Ibn Abbas, Ni'mar Rajul." And they all, no, not Ibn Abbas, sorry, uh, Ibn Omar, Ni'mar Rajul Ibn Omar. Right, you know, how how great a man Ibn Omar, if he only prayed at night, you know, if he slept at night and prayed and did night, did night prayers. So Sayyidina Ibn Omar, ever since he heard that, he never left his night prayers. Ever, right? But he could be pushed, right? Some people will be like, "Oh, you know, I'm a terrible person. I can't do my night prayers. I'm, I'm hopeless." I'm, you know. Some people they can't be pushed. Some people, you can nudge them a bit, right? and they will do better. Right? So, so as you teach, you need to observe also your students, your 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 or, or your children. Observe, right? What, where can they be pushed, and where can they be, where where can you not push them? Right? Because you need to see where is their breaking point. Right, so and I mean, you need to really observe. Right, so which is why, which is why that always class, small classroom size is always preferred. Because you can't do this in a big classroom. You really cannot. In a big classroom, it's basically called lecture. It's a lecture, right? And lecture is also a sunnah in lecture for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right, he gave khutbah. So khutbah lecture. So lecture is basically you state general uh, principles. That's in a lecture, right? But to guide, right, there needs to be a one-on-one. Right, going on, then you're able to guide. Right, so this is why as well, uh, Rasulullah he had both. He had this huge lecture situation whereby he would give khutbah to the masses, right, and then he would one by one right, guide those who needed, who needed guidance. Right. So he says here, right, uh, in, in this way, both groups joined forces to help him and uphold the responsibilities of his da'wah out of desire for reward in this world and the hereafter, and out of fear of loss and being afflicted by a calamity. He followed such a course of action because of differences in temperaments and submission could only be achieved when both the qualities of yearning and apprehension coexist. 
right? These two qualities it reinforced and perpetuated the vitality of Islam, right? So Subhanallah, the the the, the way of of making them yearn for more, at the same time making them uh, apprehensive, right? It means push, pushing them to what they, they are able to do, not to not to be uh not to be complacent, right? In how they are. And that is a sign of a good, of a good teacher, right? To be able to make your, your your students not give up hope, but at the same time don't fall into complacency. That means you try your best right, in, for the next one, but don't think that you are you know you're gone case and you can you can you can work on yourself. The third attribute of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and with regard to the injunctions of the Sharia, he steered with regard to the injunctions of the Sharia, he steered clear of excesses and short and shortcomings. And follow the middle path. The best of ways is after all that which is balanced and free of excesses and shortcomings. There is neither rectitude nor excellence in that which deviates from the middle path. Right, so the third attribute of Rasulullah is that he's always somebody of the middle path. Not too much and not too little. Right, so and there's a story of a sahaba that once, you know, they, they uh, three sahabi, right, they swore. In Allah's name, so one of them swore that you know he will he will fast and never break his fast. I got they saw us doing his worship and they felt you know we're not we're not doing enough. So one of them said, "I will fast and I will never break my fast." The second one said, "I that I will never go near woman, you know ever. I will never go near woman." And the third one said, "I will pray my whole life right, and I will never sleep." Right? So because they wanted to they wanted to 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 increase in their ibadah. So the news of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is what they did. If I remember, if I remember correctly, so Ali was one of them. Right? So Ali was one of the, one of the three. <laughs> right? So they came, the news to Rasulullah is what they did. And Rasulullah called them and said, right, do, you, uh, do you vow as how, you, how, as how I have heard that you vowed? And said, yes, Rasulullah, we vowed. Right? So that we can actually increase in our ibadah. Then Rasulullah said, as for me, I, I fast and I break my fast. I, I, I pray and I sleep. And I also have wives. I said, whosoever is not on my sunnah, they are not of me. I mean, this is my sunnah. I mean, my sunnah is not to be extreme like that. I mean, my sunnah is to do and, and to leave. You do what you can and you leave what, and you, leave what you must. I mean, but you don't you know, force onto yourself a situation right, that it can actually lead to a form of, they call it, there's a certain for it, to a form of like uh, religious mania. Uh, you can go into a mania. Of religiosity, right? if you if you try to force into yourself all of these things, which right? is why it is it is a must, right, for all believers, right, to know where is your line. Right? Of course, the wajibs are all wajib, like you must do all the wajibs. Then do what you can and know where's the line, and right? don't cross the line because it could happen that you cross the line, you overburden yourself, and you go into a form of uh, uh, craze, right, and then you give up after that. You give up all together and you don't do the, the watches thereafter. Right? So that is, that is the, the, the game of shaitan. Lah, right? Shaitan's way of, of making people go be over, over zealous, right? go overboard, right? and then they leave, they leave everything all together. Right? So right, for example, that's when it comes to also uh, studying, like seeking knowledge. Right? You like, want to go for this, want to go for that, want to go for this, want to go for that. And you want to go so many things. Right? And then, punch it. Right? And then you, you can't keep it up. You can't keep it up. It's too hard. Right, so when it's too hard, some people let go of everything. Just let go. Right, so, that is, so, so, so do what you can. So the ulama say, if you want, you do something for 40 days. Right, if you see you can handle, you add. You see you can handle, you add. Right, but to see if you can handle, that means it has to happen for 40 days. So for this in a row, if you see I can handle this, then you add. I can handle this, then you add. Right, so that, that is basically your gauge. Some ulama say, give it a year. Right, so you add to your lifestyle, give it a year. You think, okay, I can handle this, add. Give it a year. I can handle this, add. All right, so it's between four years to a year. Lah. All right, so it's depending on how heavy whatever you're adding to yourself. Leave it. Yeah. If it's very light, do it in 40, 40 days. Lah. Do very light. One year, one year, like something like, for example, you, okay, you want to fast Mondays and Thursdays. Right, so forty days is a bit uh, too short for you to know if you can handle this. So you want to istiqama Monday and Thursday fasting, right? So you one year, don't don't miss Monday and Thursday, right? And then then then, then you see oh it's, it's easy for me to fast Mondays and Thursdays, for example lah. So you want to increase your fast, right? So you increase your fast to the fast of Nabi Dawood every other day, if you want to lah. <laughs> 
ya if you want my one year Monday only. The next year Monday and Thursday. No like Monday only and Thursday only, right? Monday only <laughs> and the following year, Monday and Thursday, right? And then the following year, every other day. Right? Or some people uh they have the habit of fasting throughout Rajab Shaban Ramadan. Three months in a go. Right? <laughs> right? I mean if you want to, right? So all if you can. If you cannot, don't do it. The and the original says don't don't do it. If you cannot, don't do it. Right? Because you might you might snap. <laughs> right? Because you you not you, and then you feel so and then you feel lousy about yourself thereafter. If you, I'm a lousy person, I can't do this, I'm so you know, whatsoever. No. Take what you can. And leave what you must. And that is the middle way. Right? But of course the minimum minimum lah, your wajib is wajib. And thereafter, whatever you can handle. Right. So don't try to be so you know, be be be, be go too much into it. Alright. So the fourth attribute he did not incline towards his world, nor did he reject it outright with his sahaba. Instead, he instructed them for the middle path. He said, The best of you is the one who does not cast aside his worldly matters for the hereafter, or the hereafter for his worldly matters. The best of you is the one who benefits from this world and from the hereafter. What does this mean? This means, right, that, like for example, some people they think, Oh, I'm, I need to work for my akhirah. Right, so they begin to not go for their job, not earn money, not spend time with their family, not you know because they want to do the akhirah, 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 akhirah. So they go into another craze lah. Like of you know, I need to memorize the Quran. So memorize, 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 and then you neglect your family, you neglect your uh, your job, you neglect all the other things, other aspects of your life. Right, that is actually part of your religion, because the only religion as as prayer, fasting, Quran, prayer, fasting, Quran, prayer, fasting, Quran. Right, and then then they neglect their family thereafter. So Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What this means is that he does have his part in this world. Right? To show his, comp- his, his followers that to live your life in this world, you must have a nice balance. Right? So you do go to the beach with your family. You don't say, oh, can I go to the beach? Waste time. Right? <laughs> right? So I mean, you can, you can do that. Right? So don't, 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 don't. Or your, or, your, or, your, or your children, you know, they want to uh, play games. You know, whatever games you want to play, they cannot. You can only have Islamic games. Only Islamic games. Right? You cannot play blocks. Blocks put, put, put alibata on top, okay? And go and spell out. <laughs> hey, no, you need to have some games that are just mindless <laughs> for children. They like silly stuff. Right? So, I mean, this got, this got having a having a, a balance, right? So you don't like, everything has to be educational. Everything has to be educational. Right? No, some things can be for fun. It's okay, the children. <laughs> right? That's how Rasul Sam was. Right, like he would have this kind of this with his wives. Right, it doesn't have to be every single time. Right, but at the same time, no, no, no falling into sin. So it's a balance. It's a, there is a nice balance for 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 for, for from from Rasulullah himself. Right, his wives once they there was this thing that happened. I can't remember exactly what happened, but his wives began to throw food at each other. There was a food fight that happened between his wives. Right, because uh, they were they were no not two of them. There was a few of them. And there was a food fight that happened between his wives. Right. And and instead of him, you know, like, like scolding them, like he just sat there and he just smiled. <laughs> okay, <la. laughs> what you want to do? <laughs> just smile and let them be what they want to be. But thereafter they 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 felt regret about it, what they did. They went throwing food back and forth. Right. And then thereafter they picked up the food and they ate the food. Right? So it's not they wasted the food. They still picked up the food thereafter. Right. But he let it, let it they throw bread back and forth. It's just bread. Right, but they were throwing at each other. <laughs> and he just let it. Right, because it is for him. <laughs> right. So basically, Rasul Salah Islam is a very relaxed person. Right, at the same time, at the same time, he has his strictness. So it's a, it's a very beautiful uh, balance. They are not too complacent. And like every single time, you're wasting time. And right, no, are you too strict that every single time, you need to just be doing that one, that one, that one. You know, there has to be this general situation right, whereby you uh you 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 you, you relax la, a bit right yeah then you benefit from it in your akhira yeah in your akhira so like if they want to play darts my father bought darts today so <laughs> my father alhamdulillah <laughs> he bought darts for the kids darts though sharp no one darts <laughs> and then so they're playing play lah Right, I mean, you play and you and you and you niat, you know, satu uh, rahim, right? These these kids keep coming to my room when I'm doing my work, right? But I don't want to close my door on them, 
Uh, so then I come in and then play play with them. Whatever you want to play, play lah. <laughs> I mean, it's basically balance, right? Balance, right? With the, with this. So sports. Uh, there was once there were Abyssinians who were, who were doing a, a a show with their spears. Uh, so they were having this uh, in the time. There were Abyssinians who were there. They had their spears and they were having like a competition with their spears. And the Sahaba had gathered around and they were watching, right? And the Rasulullah allowed it. And they say, what are you all doing with time? Playing with spears. <laughs> I know, he let them play the spears. And the Sahaba were watching it and they were having fun. Watching the, the Abyssinians play with spears. And Sayyidina Aisha wanted to watch also. So he actually carried her right, so that she can look over his shoulder. Right, and she can pick and she can watch the, the, the show. Right? And Sayyidina Aisha, she narrates the hadith by saying that, that he carried me right, so that I could watch. Right? But when he carried me, right, I placed my cheek against his cheek. I, and then he asked me, are you done? And I said, no, not done. And he asked me, are you done? And he said, no, not done. And she knew, and she said, and I always said not done because I wanted my cheek to still be next to his cheek. <laughs> it wasn't about the show. I was not more, I was not going to interest in the show anymore. I just wanted to have that closeness with him. That's all. <laughs> I didn't really care about the show. <laughs> So ah, uh, cute kid. <laughs> no, she narrates. She narrates. And she said, you know, I, I, and after watching a bit, I got bored <laughs> of the show. But I wanted to sit there because right, he was carrying me. <laughs> so like this called it's called the like the udang eh, like the 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 alternative udang sebab tu lah. The Malay Malay. Yeah lah. It's basically udang sebab that means having an ulterior motive. That means it's not about it's not about the show. It's about that you want the closeness, right? But she there is a hadith, right? which means that the Sahaba were allowed. And there was once there was a there was a wedding, and then they, they, what is a normal wedding? And some said, "Where are your drums?" Uh, and then and the Sahaba said, "Look, can we hit drums?" Say yes. It's an occasion. It's a joyous occasion, right? So celebrate. Right? And then the Ansar, people of Medina, they love drums. And they love, they love to have music, you know, in their drums. So have your music. It's okay. Right, so balance, you know, because the people, people need, you know, to rest. Right, so you can, but of course on yourself, if you can carry heaviness on yourself, then carry heaviness on yourself. Uh, but you don't impose it to other people. For example, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If it's by himself, he's in prayer, zikr, Quran. Right, that is if it's by himself. Only when he's with the people. And uh, then you see him la- relax, and uh, for the sake of the people, uh, but if by himself you won't see him waste time by himself. Uh, he's always he's on his prayer. His feet are cracking, you know, because of his long standing, his recitation, contemplation. Uh, always in the presence of God Subhanahu Wa Taala. If he's by himself, when he's the people, for the sake of the people, and uh, they, they don't run away from him, because <laughs> uh, he's so strict. Uh, so this this is the the the, the, the dai the teacher. You need to understand that yourself, oh, you're very strict about this. You never watch you know, nonsense right, if you're by yourself. But like if you're the people, and maybe you, know, you might watch something with them, documentary or something good whatsoever. Or with the people, you might play, play card games. Maybe by yourself, you'll never you know, play card games whatsoever. Or with the people, if your family, right, they, op- they take out carrom board, they take out Uno, I don't know, they do stuff, right? You play, ah, uh, you play Monopoly. You just play for for the sake of the people, uh, but not too much. You don't go the whole day doing it, right? But you do a bit, uh, to 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 see to to mix with the people, so you're able to teach them better. So a teacher who plays with the students, and uh, you go out with them, and uh, you play with them, right? You 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 joke with them, you tease them, right? To get a place in the hearts of your students, right? If you if you're always so aloof. You know, who wants to to love you? <laughs> you're so alone, you're so by yourself. You know, who wants to but at the same time by yourself you are strict. On yourself you are strict. And but with your students, you know, you can be silly as much as you want. Small children be silly lah, eh? Mind all kinds of games with them. And I don't think oh it's it's beneath me or it's 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 not it's not what I preach, you know, it's not it's not what I believe in, it's not no. the children. You know, do nonsense <laughs> with them. That's what they like. And from there, as they grow older and they feel close to you, you can guide them. And that is that is the the, the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. All right. Uh, okay, we're gonna finish the fourth attribute. Eh? Then we got we just end at the fifth attribute. All right. This is the correct method because devoting oneself truly to the to to the to the one. Mm. Yeah. This is the correct method because devoting oneself totally to the one to the exclusion. Of the other were of the other would amount to an excess, while a combination of the two 
is a balance and middle power. So Saddam said, the world is an excellent steed. Ride it so that it conveys you to the hereafter. So that the world is a horse that you ride on. So that it brings you to the, he- to the hereafter. This re- this reason f- the reason for this is that a person needs to utilize the provisions of this world for his hereafter and perform as many good deeds as, pos- as possible in this world. Right? One w- who discards the world is is either deprived and lost right? or shown mercy to and subsequently right, taken care of by other people. Right? In the first case, he is incapacitated. Incapacitated. <laughs> incapacitated. Right. From doing anything. In the second case, he is despised. So what it means here is that basically, if you want to go into Zuhud, right? If you want to go into Zuhud, it means you want to denounce the world. Right? You make sure that you are supporting yourself. So you don't say, I denounce the world. You know, I'm going to go into memorizing the Quran and I'm going to neglect my entire family and my entire... You know, this is nonsense. Lah. Of course it's nonsense. Anyone, anyone would think, would know that it is nonsensical if someone wants to leave his job and everything, right? And then, and then cause other people to support him. Right, because he wants to devote himself to the next world. And that is not. And Sayyidina Omar once he saw people who came for Hajj and they had nothing with them. And then he asked them, Who are you all? And then they said, We are the Mutawakilun. And we are those who have Tawakal. Then he said, That is not Tawakal. Right, tawakal is to come with your own provision. And then you Tawakal. Right, you don't come here with nothing as you are Tawakal. You are called the, 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 the foolish. That's all you are. Are you not, or you are called the, the freeloaders. That's all you are. Right, so you don't be freeloaders on the other people. Right, you, so you work in this world for what you need in this world. And then what you don't need, you leave uh, of this world and then you focus on the next world. And so alhamdulillah, uh, the way of Rasulullah eh? right, We have three more attributes right, to finish this uh, section. Right, and then inshallah, we'll be going back to the hadith. <laughs> I, I just you know, miss the hadith. <laughs> Waiting for the hadith to re-emerge. Right? It just comes a bit later on. Right, but, inshallah, but it's important for us to actually go through the, the attributes. Right, and then when we go into the hadith, you know, uh, the Sheikh he will, uh, he will explain, he will, he will make clear to us more, right, about the ways of teaching. He goes into specific ways of teaching, right, specific uh, methods of, uh, of teaching. All right, any question? Yeah. Hmm. So you know that they can, but they, they make a lot of noise to yeah, not. So the kind of uh, students, right, what can push them is if they see a benefit. They see a benefit. That's the only thing. Because if you try to push, push, push by just saying it, right, then, I mean, it will just come in one year, come out the other year. They just ignore you. Right? Because they don't want to push themselves. They might just ignore you. Right? And, but of course, if you keep pushing them, they won't break anyway. Right? Because they're not, they're not in despair. You know, or they don't feel like they're hopeless. Right? But what will happen is they will be annoyed with you. Yeah. They get very annoyed with you. Right? So, so it, uh, and that might put them off altogether right, from what you're trying to push them on. They may put off. Right? Because they have, they have a character issue. For them, it's a character issue. Right, so so uh, in that situation, right, usually incentives is what will help them, right, or leave them and let them figure it out themselves. That means that means they have to settle themselves, ah. That means they have to they have to come to their own conclusion, what they want in life, right. So I mean, a lot of my students are like that, you know. So so you try to, ah, huh? well, guess where. Oh, who? Oh, is it? Okay. Okay, my mom has guests coming. I don't know. I don't was here. Okay, never mind. Okay, okay. So, ah? Uh? Okay. So, um, I said, no, Muhammad. Yeah, she, my mom has guests. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, so basically, for this kind of situation, either they, they see, they, they see, they see why they should push themselves. Because most likely, the, the reason why, reason why they are lazy. Most is lazy, right? Kind of lazy, yeah. They don't really see the point in pushing. They don't see the point. So, like, what will make somebody uh, motivated 
is when they see the point. Right? Or they see that their goal. Right? If they have no goal, there's no motivation. And then there's nothing you can do or say to force it. Right? And, and, unless you go the way of making them resent it. You know, the more you push, the more they will. And you don't want to go that way. You don't want to make them resent it. Right? Because it's going to just let go altogether. Right? So that's why when it comes to parents, when it comes to uh, teaching the religion, sometimes it might get, you might get overzealous in it. That, that the parents were so religious that it pushed the child away. You know, and we've seen cases where they're pushed away because the parents didn't let the child explore this religion for themselves and then they themselves embrace it. But they just see that their whole lives, their parents forced them on it. So when they could let go, they let go. Right? That is not, not what you want. You want them to hold on, not because you're making them hold on. You want them to hold on by their own choice that they're holding on. And that's what a teacher does. Right? It means you can let go of the wheel. Right? And, they can, and they, can, they can drive themselves. It means, like, like, like bicycle, lah. And then you gym house cycle, right? You don't hold them all the time. Right? And they're only cycling because you're pushing them. Right? You need to be able to let go and they need to be able to cycle themselves. That's the point of teaching. Right? So, so, so you're pushing too hard, it might make them feel that they're only going forward because you're pushing them. And the moment you stop, they're going to let go of everything. <laughs> so it's best that you don't, you don't do that. But you talk to them, tell them the, the benefits of it. They see lah, the benefits of what's happening. If they want to, they can take it up. If you don't want to, then how else? They do something in their lives, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Well, you can't force it. You can't force it. Okay. All right. Sallallahu ala sallam Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Amin. الفاتحة أن الله يرزقنا أمنا في ملا خالص مقبول ستعلم ودل على خدا ويصر بلا قبل النبي صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم والأرواح المعالمين وما شيخنا والذو الحقوق علينا وإلى حضر النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم الفاتحة سنة رحمن رحيم والعصرين سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك اشهد ان لا اله الا انت استغفرك واتوب اليك صلى الله عليه وسلم محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم الحمد لله رب العالمين امين